I'd like to welcome you all to this morning's CPD program from Michael Green's list. My name is Paul Santa Maria, and I'm going to introduce our <coughs> two presenters this morning. To my immediate right is Megan Fitzgerald, a barrister, and Rupert Waters, another barrister on Michael's list. And you will see some short biographies of Megan and Rupert in the materials and I won't read those. You might read them for yourselves, but you'll see that each of our presenters has substantial experience in the subject matter of our discussion this morning, focusing on the regulatory aspects of <coughs> uh, the practice of uh, law and also issues that arise from time to time in practice, um, which in some cases lead to claims of professional negligence against solicitors and barristers. And so um, I think it's a timely topic um, because we need to be reminded of our <clears throat> the way in which the um, parliament regulates our, our practice as lawyers and our <clears throat> duties and responsibilities. The structure of this morning's seminar is um, perhaps to move away from the traditional lecture format and to invite and to promote discussion because as I look around the room I see there is a, a very substantial body of accumulated experience in the practice of uh, the law and so what I'm going to do is to suggest and I know that Megan and Rupert will agree is to promote some discussion between the, the floor and um, this panel about issues that arise from time to time. What we would like to do is to spend the first 25 minutes or so competing with the construction works behind us in discussing the regulatory framework. <coughs> then we might have a short five or ten minute break and if I'm right, in the materials, you will see that there are two case scenarios um, included as part of the materials, and those scenarios will form the backdrop of <clears throat> the discussion that we're going to have about um, issues arising around professional negligence. I read both of those scenarios late last night. I found it very difficult to get to sleep after reading them because I thought, um, there but for the grace of God go, I. Oh, what a terrible situation to be in in either of those two scenarios, particularly the first one. But um, I think they're uh, interesting and thought-provoking and um, we'll get to those in the second uh, part of the, of the uh, discussion this morning. So I'm going to ask um, Megan and Rupert now to commence the discussion by uh, providing us with an overview of the regulatory framework in Victoria of the, the practice of the profession. Megan. Thanks, Paul. Um, I'll start by just giving you a very basic overview of the regulatory uh, system. Now, the first thing to think about is the Legal Profession Act, which uh, essentially governs all of our conduct and our admission to practice in Victoria. It covers a number of things, including the admission of lawyers um, and the continuing admission of lawyers, so whether you can be um, have your practising certificate renewed. It also covers a number of things uh, to do with getting things right, um, so um, it uh, makes provision for the making of rules, which um, I'll talk about in a moment, and it covers uh, the, the major topics like trust money and trust accounting, and costs disclosure and review. It also uh, provides for the uh, Legal Services Board, the Legal Services Commissioner, and um, the Legal Practice List at VCAT. The, um, the Act makes provision for the making of rules, and for solicitors, those rules are the Professional Conduct and Practice Rules 2005, which the LOV produces. For barristers, it's the Victorian Bar Incorporated Practice Rules, um, and those are um, rules that are made 
binding under the Act. The, the rules, generally speaking, uh, include a number of motherhood statements about uh, not engaging in conflict, not uh, in, you know, not uh, behaving in a dishonest way, those sorts of obvious things. Um, but they also are quite a, a helpful source where, um, where you do come across something a bit more complex um, or, or troubling. For example, in the solicitor's rules, there are um, quite clear guidelines on what to do if uh, your instructions are withdrawn and another solicitor is instructed and uh, there's a request for your file to be handed over and, and you know, whether you can claim a lien in that situation. Uh, the Act also provides for the making of regulations. Now, the regulations uh, provide the nuts and bolts to the trust accounting practices and to costs disclosure and costs review. The Act also creates the Legal Services Commissioner. Now, um, some of you in the room may be familiar with the Commissioner, but um, essentially the Commissioner is there to uh, investigate complaints. And complaints can be made on two different bases. The first is civil complaints, so those are complaints about uh, costs up to $25,000 and complaints about uh, loss. So essentially the Commissioner can consider small negligence claims or breach of contract claims uh, up to the $25,000 limit as well. Um, with respect to those civil disputes, if the Commissioner can't resolve them by either mediation or, um, or correspondence between the parties, uh, the Commissioner then has the power to give the parties their rights to take the dispute to VCAT. And that's how a lot of the um, cost disputes make their way to VCAT. Um, and unfortunately, that means that VCAT involves a lot of uh, self-represented litigants fighting uh, cost disputes that quite often are uh, more complex than um, would be desirable. The um, matters can't be brought to VCAT under the Legal, pra Legal Profession Act unless the, the Commissioner has given rights. So um, <coughs> then um, you, you find that the Legal Practice List is also considering uh, small negligence claims or breach of contract claims or costs disputes under the Fair Trading Act or the uh, newly named Australian Consumer Law and Fair Trading Act. The other thing that the Commissioner does is consider disciplinary um, complaints. And um, when a client usually, or sometimes the Commissioner, um, becomes aware of conduct that is of concern and brings an own motion investigation, the, um, the Commissioner will then investigate the conduct of the lawyer. And in the vast majority of cases, if the lawyer gives a thorough response and um, an explanation, provides some hopefully helpful file notes or letters of advice, the commissioner will deal with the matter quite quickly and often dismiss it or um, deal with it in a, in a relatively um, moderate way, so with maybe a reprimand or, or something of that sort. So I, I guess the thing to take from that is if you do happen to get one of these letters from the Commissioner that says a complaint has been made, please provide your response and any supporting documents, um, it's really, really worthwhile providing a thorough uh, response and, and any documents you have to try and nip it in the bud as quickly as possible. The um, Commissioner, once that investigation process is over, if there is a reasonable basis for a finding uh, at the tribunal of professional misconduct or unsatisfactory professional conduct, the Commissioner um, will then take the matter to VCAP and make an application for disciplinary orders against the practitioner. Now, generally speaking, unsatisfactory professional conduct, which is the lower form um, of professional misconduct, uh, is defined by the Act and it's, it's generally speaking conduct that falls short of what you might expect from a reasonable practitioner. 
And professional misconduct is similarly dis defined and is essentially just same sort of conduct but worse. The um, decisions in the tribunal and the courts have also preserved common law <laughs> professional misconduct um, and that's very much a similar thing. It's um, conduct which would reasonably be regarded as disgraceful or dishonourable by uh, solicitors of good repute and competency. Now, um, the tribunal hears a number of uh, applications by the commissioner about these, that sort of conduct. And of course, you have your most extreme type of case, which is your, your Mr. Brot or your Mr. Forster, where um, those cases involve things like billing clients twice for the same work or uh, acting without any form of instructions um, in, in um, disputes. But the tribunal also hears um, the, the more uh, understandable sort of situations, the situations where things have uh, spiralled out of control to some extent for a practitioner and the, um, the normal course of events isn't to interfere with anyone's practising certificate but um, quite often there'll be a reprimand or a fine imposed um, for situations where the, the conduct of the practitioner just hasn't been quite up to par. The other thing that I'll um, just touch on in terms of our regulatory scheme is the Legal Practitioners Liability Committee. The LPLC is the professional indemnity insurer for virtually all solicitors and barristers in Victoria. And they, uh, they get involved when a, a civil claim is made against a practitioner, so generally speaking a negligence claim or a, a breach of contract claim for damages. The um, LPLC uh, step in and insure those claims and um, they don't cover your disciplinary disputes or um, defalcations, other sorts of complaints, fines and investigations. Um, and uh, I'll pass over now to Rupert who will give a bit of an overview of the basics of the law of negligence as it applies to us. Just before you do, Sarah, Megan, I'm just wondering, when matters are at VCAT and there are serious um, allegations of professional misconduct made against a um, practitioner, who tends to hear those cases at VCAT? Is it other they senior members or can you...? Yes, um, there are a number of um, different members who hear those matters. Generally speaking at the moment, the vast majority are heard by senior member Smithers. Um, and there are um, Mr McNamara and um, who, Judge McNamara I should say now, um, and um, senior member of Butcher also hear a lot of those matters. Um, uh, my understanding is generally speaking they'll put someone um, managing that list who is a prof professional lawyer of long yeah. standing and yeah. um, that they're, they're dealt with in a very methodical and um, mm. calm manner, generally speaking. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Megan. Rupert, sorry I interrupted you. Thank you. So I'm just going to start with a brief overview of negligence. I mean, negligence situations are so fact-bound that there's a limit to what I can really say beyond some general points, which hopefully will help you if you do happen to be on the receiving end of a writ of negligence. Um, first point, of course, is to contact the LPLC as soon as possible. So it's obviously the case that a solicitor owes a duty to take reasonable care in the exercise of their professional practice. And that duty is the same whether in contract or in tort, at least in New South Wales, which is where Hayden and NRA comes from. Now, that duty importantly includes a, warn a requirement to warn of inherent risks in the tra transaction. Although what is an inherent risk to some extent depends on the nature of the transaction. So in the case of Credit Lyonnais, which is referred to in the document, you had a situation where a client wanted to extend the right to exercise a break option, but the terms of the contract did not in fact permit that extension. So the solicitor was briefed and they claimed that their instructions were simply to write to the other side and say, can we extend the break option? They, weren't actually, they claimed not to have been instructed to advise whether or not the break option was in fact extendable. And the, Court of Appeal in England said, well, if there's an obvious critical point 
you need to raise that with your client, notwithstanding that your client might not have raised that issue with you as regards one they want, in, want advice on. Hayden and NRMA, it was a bit more of a general point. There is probably no general obligation to just advise on the possibility that the law may change uh, because that's the sort of inherent risk. That is an inherent risk, but it's a, it's a more generalized risk. But again, if you're aware of anything that says that the law in an area might change, then you are likely to have to advise on that risk. Now, the scope of the duty is ordinarily defined by a solicitor's retainer. Uh, but it is possible that in some circumstances it goes further. In Hawkins and Clayton, Justice Dean said that you may have to advise on, for example, the risk of economic loss arising from a particular transaction. Now, in Hayden and NRMA, the New South Wales Court of Appeal, composed entirely of judges from outside New South Wales that it happened, um, said that that was not really the case. Um, but in the more recent Victorian case of AJH, Lawyers and Hamo, um, that appeared to be endorsed by Justice Nettle, with whom Justice Maxwell agreed. So it needs to be taken seriously as a possibility in this state, although, as it happens, that comment was obiter, and uh, ultimately the court rejected an argument that the law firm in that case had been negligent by failing to advise that resisting an action for winding up was pointless, um, in large part because the Court of Appeal said it wasn't pointless. Um, and then I refer to David and David, which you know, tends to follow Hayden and NRMA. There's also a point that the scope of your duty will vary depending on how sophisticated your client is. So in both Astley, Oz Trust and Astley and National Home Loans Corporation, you had fairly sophisticated clients, people who did this on a regular basis. And therefore the court said, well, if you've got a sophisticated client who comes to you asking for advice about a specific point, you're probably safe to just advise them on the specific point. There's less scope to simply sort of imply a requirement to give ex, ex, additional advice because they don't. Whereas if you had, for example, um, an elderly person of a non-English speaking background come in wanting to talk to you about guaranteeing a mortgage, you would want to give them pretty comprehensive advice about what all the risks were of entering into that transaction. So that does affect the, uh, the duty of care. Now the standard of care is pretty straightforward. It is the it is a reasonable degree of care based on your area of expertise at the date of the alleged negligence. Uh, importantly, it doesn't actually go higher if you hold yourself out as an expert. In, um, in Hayden, again, Justice Dyson, Hay well, Dyson Hayden as he then was, Justice Hayden as he later was, was recognized as an expert in trade practice litigation. And it was held that he did not owe a higher standard of care simply by dint of that role. The duty always remains to exercise reasonable skill and care. Uh, and importantly, it does, you don't do that simply by getting it wrong. Uh, in Stam Strambrandt and Hanscom, which is referred there, a case against uh, uh, Ms. Hanscom SC, um, it was specifically stated that you don't, you're not negligent just because your advice is wrong. It's only if you fail to exercise reasonable skill and care. Turning to the issue of loss, that's governed by statute nowadays, the Wrongs Act. You just need to prove on the balance of probabilities that the negligence caused the loss. But it does raise an important issue, which is the next paragraph, which is loss of a chance. Many solicitors' negligence cases will involve a loss of a chance. For example, if a claim becomes statute barred so that the litigation cannot proceed, then the person will have lost the chance to pursue that litigation. In that case, the court conducts what it describes as a trial within a trial where it sort of goes through all the aspects of the proceedings and sort of tries to figure out how much you'd have probably got in damages in the end subject to various discounts for vicissitudes, lawyers fees, those kinds of things. So for example in a case that's not actually mentioned here, a recent <coughs> county court decision, uh, White Cleland Proprietary Limited and Burgess Properties Proprietary Limited uh, came case became statute barred, a debt claim for approximately $100,000, and the amount of damages awarded in that case was $15,000, despite a finding of negligence. So there is some scope for variation in terms of the awards that are being made. And finally, I'm just going to talk briefly about advocates' immunity. And the first point to make about advocates' immunity is that you do not want to rely upon advocates' immunity. It's great that it provides some immunity from suit, but the net effect of it is you will go through a long and involved trial 
uh, only to have your defense made out. You would always rather not have to go through a trial. Um, that said, it does exist and it does protect solicitors in respect of certain work, being work sort of that is, as a, the GNLE and Wraith quote is there, work done out of court which leads to a decision affecting the conduct of the case. So that's really, um, those are really the issues I want to discuss in relation to just negligence as a whole. I think now we've got a, we've got a list of what we describe as common issues to look out for and we'll sort of try and open it up to the floor a bit here. Um, these are, as we say, common issues which do arise in negligence cases and disciplinary proceedings and they're somewhat helpful um, in just trying to spot things before they happen and nip them in the bud. So. The first thing that commonly leads to complaints is lack of communication and, and that can result in either a complaint to the Commissioner about a, a disciplinary matter or a, a negligence claim. Um, surprised clients are often unhappy clients and, and, and clients who are kept in the loop and um, feel that you are looking out for their best, best interests are much less likely to make a complaint about you. Um, and if they do make a complaint, the outcome will be a lot better if it can be shown that you were doing everything you could to do the right thing. Um, and, and on a similar note, the, the next point that we have there is a soured relationship with a client is um, never a good thing. It, it not only can lead to complaints about you, but it can also lead to um, you not doing your job as well as you might otherwise. Um, everyone's had one of those black files that they just don't want to open, but um, it, it's best to, to do something about that as early as you can, whether that means ending your retainer or um, speaking to a colleague and seeing mm. if you can, can transfer the file to them. Um, it's, it's best to not let it get to the stage that it, that it did in the case of Mills Oakley Lawyers and Hugh and Property Holdings, where the partner responsible for the file um, had a falling out with the client and essentially delegated all the remaining work to a senior associate who wasn't adequately equipped to handle the case. Um, and things went, went mm. very pear-shaped after that. The, the next issue um, that commonly leads to problems is costs and billing. Um, again, it's, it's the surprise element that often leads to problems here. Um, costs disclosure is really important um, if you want to minimise the hassle to yourself. Um, make sure it's clear, make sure it's written in plain English and um, make sure that you talk through it with your client and, and if they're showing concerns, be open, upfront. Um, you may not be able to tell them exactly, exactly what a, a file's going to cost but you need to be clear on what the contingencies are and what the, the potential costs could be. Uh, another one, as we have there, is lack of clarity about who the client is. And again, we see this to some extent in Mills Oakley, where there's a sort of shading together of a client who is both a director of a company and a sort of private client. So in th those kind of situations can really lead to questions about who your client are. Again, when you're acting for married couples, sometimes there are differences of opinion, that, for example, as to how to proceed. I've got a case at the moment where there is a where that is an issue and we have to be very careful about how to proceed and particularly if it would later be the case that one person wanted to settle and one didn't, we might have to look at um, well, seeking separate representation mm -hmm. for one or the other members of the couple which would obviously be quite difficult. Mm -hmm. Lack of clarity about scope of instructions and matters. Um, so yes, you need to define your instructions and this is brought home by a fairly recent decision of the Tasmanian Full Court, Doolin and Rencon, in which um, the court said, well, they were given pretty vague instructions, but they made no attempt to actually clarify or limit what their instructions were. And so ultimately, the solicitors in that case were found to be negligent, largely because they hadn't answered all the questions that were raised in these initial vague inquiries. If they just sat down and said, well, this is what we want answers on, well, what do you want answers on, then they would have um, narrowed the scope of their retainer and probably avoided liability for negligence. Uh, supervision, another issue here. Um, we keep coming back to Mills Oakley. We probably shouldn't be so uh, 
mean for the firm, but um, there's a quote there that sets out really an issue. And again, this arises from the soured client <coughs> relationship. Um, so you can see how one thing flows into another. Uh, it, it, on that supervision thing, um, perhaps unfortunately for Mills Oakley, I'm going to talk about them a little bit more. Um, the, 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 that case and a number of things that happened for that firm um, make it very clear <coughs> that supervision is vital and respon taking responsibility for your junior employees is, is really um, something you should be careful about. Um, the, the quote that appears there relates to a particular partner and a particular senior associate, who I won't name, um, but they, in that particular case, it was a negligence action um, and it was found that the, the partner was negligent for not having supervised this um, quite junior senior associate properly. Um, a similar issue relate, relating to the same pair of people arose where um, Mills Oakley wrote to a um, tenant of a caravan park and told him to uh, cease and desist from making uh, uh, defamatory comments about the owner of that caravan park. And what they also asked the tenant to do was to ensure that his local member of parliament stopped making comments in parliament about the uh, owner of the caravan park. <laughs> and Mills Oakley were found to be in contempt of parliament for having um, you know, breached the parliamentary privilege. And um, that was, for Mills Oakley, the final straw in um, losing their VWA contract, which obviously had enormous fallout for the firm um, and its employees. So just a reminder to supervise junior lawyers and make sure you read the correspondence they are sending out on your firm's letterhead. <laughs> a related issue that we don't actually list here, but <coughs> frankly probably should have, uh, is just expertise. If you don't have expertise in an area, you may need to be careful about taking on work in that area. I mean, you know, if someone comes to you with an admiralty claim, you know, you need to think, am I ready for an admiralty claim? And it may be that you'll be fine, you just need to brief an appropriate counsel or whatever, but expertise can be an issue in these things. You're making me feel very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> You're the appropriate <laughs> counsel, aren't you, Paul? <laughs> Um, the next issue is pressured settlements. It, it, it's unavoidable when you're a litigator that you're going to have settlements at the door of court or settlements um, in a mediation where a good offer is made and you're urging your client to take it but your client's showing some reluctance. Um, and it, it's not improper to place a certain amount of pressure on a client to um, understand that an offer may be good or that they should make a particular offer to settle a, a, a case, but um, at, at the very least, if if you can see that there's a likelihood that there, there might be negotiations at the door of court, it's well worth preparing your client in advance, um, discussing possible ranges of outcomes um, and, and discussing the way that those sorts of negotiations tend to happen in advance of that hearing date so that they're not taken by surprise or um, feeling like they're being ambushed um, by the, the pressured negotiations um, in those circumstances. Um, another thing um, on a very different sort of issue, but one that frequently arises in uh, negligence actions, is uh, solicitor's certificates of independent advice these certificates were the fallout from Amadio and Garcia. Basically, to protect themselves, the banks now require that any guarantor who's giving a guarantee without any benefit from the transaction, so your, your elderly Italian parents or your, um, or your wife, um, your, your special wife, as they would put it in Garcia, um, they require those people who are not getting a benefit from the transaction to have a certificate filled out by a lawyer saying, I've given this person independent legal advice about the potential consequences of this transaction. Frequently the way it happens in practice is that the person picks up the guarantee, the mortgage and the certificate from the bank walks a couple of doors down to the local suburban solicitor's office, walks in and says, can you sign these documents for me? 
And unfortunately, there have been quite a few solicitors out there who uh, just think it's a bit like witnessing and uh, receiving an affidavit or um, a stat deck. And um, they'll sign away, charge the client $150 and end up with a massive claim for negligence against them. So it's really important if you are a um, solicitor that that may possibly happen to at some point, um, make sure when someone comes in with a document like that, that you read it and that you take a copy of it and that you make a note of the advice that you gave because if you don't have any records, then you're not gonna win that case. Um, it's the final issue is really just one of limitations. I mean, it's always just sensible when the file comes in to just check if there is a limitations issue here because sometimes these things have been bouncing around for a very long time um, before they get to you, and it's true of barristers and solicitors, and you just, it always helps to check because the last thing you want to do is to get sued because a claim went out of time on your watch. Um, it's a fairly simple point, and in many cases it won't really be relevant, but it's always worth doing. And Sorry, first final point is file notes. Keep your file ordered. Make sure you archive your files in a, in a way that makes them um, able to be found later. Um, as a junior solicitor, I once was sent to the crawl space under a practitioner's uh, mother's house to go through boxes of files um, that were in his Getting down archives. Mm -hmm. uh, you might not be surprised to know that the file didn't turn up. <laughs> So, um, yeah, for, for people like me, keep your files ordered. <laughs> Megan, what happens when you mentioned before about um, the LPLC, what happens when you open an envelope and there's a letter of um, complaint alleging that you've been um, negligent in some shape or form? Um, you, uh, make a, you draw the attention of the LPLC as, as early as possible for good reason. What happens after that? Yeah, um, well, the LPLC encourages lawyers to um, contact them as soon as possible. And one of the things that they will do is if you ring them up with a, or I think something might have gone a bit wrong on this, I haven't actually received a, a, a claim or a letter of demand or anything like that yet, but um, I'm just to be concerned, they'll happily discuss the matter with you. Um, and you're not required to pay any deductibles or make any sort of official notification unless it's warranted in the circumstances. Um, the, once it's clear that there is a claim, um, then the LPLC will, generally speaking, instruct one of their panel solicitors. So they, they have a number of panel partners in firms um, and they'll um, instruct them to conduct some investigations, they'll get the lawyer into, the, the, the insured lawyer into the firm to take some initial instructions, perhaps um, dig out the file and go through it, um, and do a quick review to make sure there's there's something that might give you a defence, um, and then they'll, they'll take it from there. Um, sometimes in the, the smaller matters, the LPLC do also um, handle the matters in-house. Uh, they All of their claims managers are very experienced lawyers, so they also um, do handle some matters in-house, um, especially in cases where there's a chance that the matter might be able to re be resolved without the practitioner having to even pay their entire deductible, because those deductibles can be quite um, considerable, especially if there's a deterrent one in place which doubles your, your deductible in certain circumstances. And these experiences can be fairly bruising. What happens um, in terms of the relationship between the insured solicitor and the LPLC where the solicitor has quite properly given early notice to the insurer of the claim but takes the view that the claim is a try on and that there's been no negligence on the solicitor's own part mm. um, and encounters a different view within the LPLC. How are those sorts of issues yeah. resolved? The really difficult issues, and they will be case specific. Um, in if if the LPLC or their their um, lawyers review the file, speak to the practitioners, and agree that there is a good defence, they certainly um, are not a soft touch when it comes to litigation. Um, they um, they also 
are not allowed to settle a case without instructions from the insured. Um, and that is always a, a difficult thing to manage, those conflicts between insured and insurer. But um, they do have provision, and we've all got the same policy, and they're available online, but they all have provision for a, um, it's, if you, if you don't agree to settle a matter, and you've, it's been recommended to you, you put yourself on risk. So the LPLC can, um, if they recommend a settlement offer and you don't agree to make it, then their liability is limited to that amount of the, the recommended settlement and you then are um, a liable for um, anything after that. The insurer will not settle any claim against any insured without the prior consent of the firm. But if the firm does not accept any recommendation for settlement by the insurer, the insurer's liability will be limited to the amount of the settlement recommended plus costs and expenses up to the date upon which the recommendation was made. So it that tends to uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> sort things out, generally speaking. Um, Megan Rupert, thank you very much for that um, uh, introduction to our topic this morning.